Okay, this is the lecture video for Mac 1105 College Algebra. We're in section 5.1 where we're going to take a look at exponential functions. And so we begin with the definition of such a function. An exponential function is a function with a base that is greater than zero, in other words, positive base. That base cannot be equal to one, and the exponent can be any real number. We have examples of such functions down below. 2 to the x, notice that this base is greater than 0, it's positive, and it's not equal to 1. Likewise for all these bases. And then the variable just represents an exponent that can be any real number. So we have a base of 10 here, a base of 3, and a base of 1 half. Okay, these examples, examples 1 and 2, just uh, represent uh, evaluating exponential functions by use of your calculator. So just make sure that you're able to enter these things in your calculator. The first one is 5. Use the power key found right under the clear button. Raised to uh, power of square root of 3. So second function, call up that square root symbol. And we have 16.24. When you are using your calculator to evaluate the exponential function, uh, you'll be rounding to a, a particular place, and that will be indicated in the software where you're doing your homework. They'll tell you what place to round to, and it may be different each time. Let's just round to the hundredths place for examples 1 and 2. So 16.24 for this first answer. Okay, then the next one is 7 raised to a power of negative 1.6. And notice that you don't need a um, parenthesis around that power because it's negative because look, you're going to get the same answer if you do put a parenthesis or whether you leave the parenthesis off. But just to demonstrate, 7 raised up to negative 1.6, close that, so you get the same answer. Sometimes a parenthesis is necessary around um, the exponent, specifically if it is a uh, fraction, and I believe the radicals uh, may require it also. So this will, to the hundredths place would be 0.04. Okay. Uh, moving to um, how to evaluate radicals that are not just typical square roots and where to find uh, the keys that will allow you to do that. There's a couple of different ways that you can enter such a problem, so I'll demonstrate both. So the example that I have here, I'm just going to bring it down here. 3 to the 4th is your radicand. Radicand is the name of the number that's underneath the radical, and you're evaluating the fifth root of this number. This is the same thing as 81, so when entering it, you can enter it just like this, or you can enter an 81. So there is a way that you can press this in, um, just by telling your calculator that you're going to take a fifth root rather than a square root or a cube root. Um, and these options and keystrokes are found under the math key. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate that. When you're taking any kind of root other than a square root that you actually have a key for or a cube root that you actually have a key for under the math key, you have to tell it what the root is first. This is the kind of root that you are taking. So if it's anything beyond a cube root, you have to say that first, what kind of root. Then you have to call up um, this symbol right here. So just what you're seeing right here in my instructions. You're telling it I'm about to take a radical of x root, and you've already indicated what kind of root that is. And then you just feed in whatever the radicand is. Okay, so I'll demonstrate that. These are found again under the math key. Okay, so we're going to go tell it the root, what type of root first, then hit the math key. Those instructions are printed on the outline. Uh, go down to option number five, and you can just arrow down if you want, or you can just hit option five if you want to call up uh, x root. Okay, we've already told it what the index is, which is that little x you see there, that it's a fifth root, and now just feed in the radicand, which is three to the fourth, and you get 
uh, 2.41. We'll round this to the hundredths place as well. You may also put this in exponential form, which is why it's part of this discussion, because anything that's a radical can also be written in exponential form. So if you want to enter it as a base and an exponent, it would be 3 to the 4 this, where that index, this is called the index, where that index becomes the denominator of a fractional exponent. So then you would just enter it into your calculator as 3 raised up to an exponent. You have to put the exponent because it's a fraction in parentheses because you're telling your calculator calculate this value first then go 3 raised to that single number. So 3 raised up to a power of 4 divided by 5 and you get the same answer that we got when we used the uh, radical keys. Notice that if you don't put the power in, um, if you don't put this power, this exponent, you can call it by either name. If you don't put it in parentheses, look what happens. 3 raised to a power of 4 fifths. See that you get a different answer. Okay, so fractional exponents, also called rational exponents, uh, must be put into a parenthesis. So again, 2.41. Should obviously be getting the same answer regardless of the way you press it in. Uh, I'm talking about radical form or exponential form, but you have to know uh, based on the form you're going to choose, are there parentheses needed for either one of those forms? Okay, so just a little demonstration of that. Now you get to these problems on the next page. And you're evaluating uh, exponential functions uh, at certain values. Okay, so here is the actual exponential function. Two-thirds raised to a power of w. Okay, so this is two-thirds. Now these you're going to be working by hand. Notice that it doesn't say anything about calculators and it doesn't say anything about rounding. Those are both indications that you may use your calculator, which at that point you're not showing any of the steps. Your calculator is doing them all. You need to be able to demonstrate at this level that you know the mechanics for doing it by hand. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate now. So two-thirds to a power of zero. Uh, for this one, there's really no work to do. Instead, this is a property. Anything raised to a power of zero is one. This, you're definitely going to be able to show that you understand the significance. You're expected to show, you know, the significance of a negative exponent. So, whenever you have a, any kind of base... And you can always think of any base, the bases that you're going to get, you're going to be either given a fraction or an integer. And if it's a negative exponent, the way you go from a negative exponent to a positive exponent is that you just use the reciprocal. In other words, flip the base. And the minute that you flip the base, the exponent becomes positive. At that point, the exponent can be applied to the numerator as well as the denominator so that you can actually demonstrate that you know the steps for calculating, um, for evaluating this base to this exponent, but you're showing the step by hand. Okay, 3 to the third is 27. 2 to the third on the bottom is 8. And that's your final answer, demonstrating it by hand. Okay, if you have two-thirds just to a positive power, here you're just raising it to a power of three, then you don't have to worry about going through any of this flipping of the base. That's only done when you're trying to go from a negative exponent to a positive exponent so that you can carry out the rest of the steps. This one begins with a base raised to a positive um, exponent, and so you can jump right into the step where you apply that exponent to the top as well as the bottom. So no flipping required in this one. And therefore, you get the opposite of what you just got in the previous answer. You get the 8 at the top and the 27 at the bottom. Okay, and then um, evaluated at 1, it would be the base, 2 thirds, 
raised to a power of one. Anything raised to a power of one, any base raised to a power of one is just going to be whatever the base is. Okay, going to an exponential function that has a couple more steps involved in it. It's not just a base and an exponent, but there's a couple of other um, terms that are in this exponential function. Okay, so we're going to go negative 4, and then it's going to be e to the, here we're evaluating at 0, that means we're putting 0 in for v, so it would be 0, take away 3. You're going to have to use your calculator here because of the base. The base, this base e, happens to be um, a number that's like pi. It's a decimal that runs on and on and on, and so you're going to need the calculator to do these. And you'll see, you know, I'll point out to you where the key is that has this value. Okay, so it's going to be negative 4 times e raised to a power of negative 3. And that's because 0 take away 3 is negative 3. We'll press that in. And why don't we round again to the hundreds place? Okay. So it's negative 4 times, call up that e function, it's right on the ln key, or I'm pointing, and then feed in whatever the power is, which is negative 3 in this case. Okay, and so we get negative 0 0.20, because if we round this to the hundredths place, this becomes... This 9 carries over, making this 20, so 0 0.20 with the negative. Negative 0 0.20. And you can put that leading 0. It typically is written. I don't think that they'll mark it wrong. I don't believe they will. But you can just always provide that as well. Okay, now we're going to plug in 1. So this will be negative 4. E raised up to a power of 1 minus 3. And I'm going to give this answer in exact form, and I'm also going to give it an approximate form, just so you're always getting practice at giving exact answers, because many times you'll be forced to give the answer like that. So this is going to be negative 4 times e to the negative 2. Now that would be the easiest um, form to actually enter it into the calculator if you were asked to give an approximate answer. I would enter it just like that. If you're asked to give an exact answer, um, then the negative exponents are not permitted, and so you would give negative 4. Anything with a negative exponent, real, it does not mean that this term right here is negative. It means that it is a term that belongs in the denominator, and once you pull this base and this exponent down into the denominator, it allows you to write the exponent in a positive form. So that is a, as far as you would go if you were asked to give this in exact form. If they ask you to give a decimal approximation, um, and I'll round it to the hundredths place again, this would be the easiest way to press it in rather than pressing it in as a fraction, although you could press it in like this if you'd like. So negative 4 times second function, call up that e and feed in the power. And that would be to the hundredths place, negative 0.54. Okay, if you're asked to plug in 2, that would be negative 4 times e to 2 minus 3. And this would be negative 4 to e to the negative 1. Okay, I'll give both answers again. This will be negative 4, and if you were to give this answer without its negative exponent, because that's considered the most simplified version of a negative exponent, you would drag all of this down to the denominator. This exponent would now be positive and leave it like that. So this is what we would call an exact answer, because to go any further, you're going to get a decimal. Okay, when pressing this into the calculator, you may press it in like this. That would be fine. You might find it easier to press it in like this. That's up to you. Either one's going to get you the same answer. So negative 4 times call up that e 
tell it what the power is, and it would be to the hundredths place, negative 1.47. Okay, and then f of 3, the function evaluated at 3 would just be negative 4, e, take that 3, plug in right here, and you would end up with negative 4 times e to the 0. Might not need your calculator for that because anything to the 0 power is 1. That's this e term. And then multiplied by negative 4, would be negative 4, and that's an exact answer. No need to round it off, it is exact. Okay, so just a little discussion about how you can give um, anything involving E in an exact form. I demonstrated that here, and I was also able to review um, how you simplify a base with a negative exponent just by bringing it to the denominator. Okay, moving on to a major component of this section is discussing graphs, being able to uh, transform them. In other words, do vertical shifts and horizontal shifts and reflect them. In other words, flip them uh, either uh, over the x-axis or the y-axis, so transformations on original parent graphs. So we're going to talk about that. Also going to talk about domain and range and asymptotes because this particular function has an asymptote and that asymptote is typically at the x-axis unless the graph shifts around. It can, uh, if the graph shifts up vertically or uh, either up or down, then the asymptote is going to go with it. But right now in its basic parent uh, form where there's no numbers being added up added or subtracted here causing either a vertical shift up or a vertical shift down the horizontal asymptote is going to be right here at the x-axis so let's just talk about some key features on this graph I've also provided you with a table where I've given you quite a few values negative three all the way down to three we'll use uh, a little bit less than that when we do our own graphs but I want you to be able to do these graphs by hand. I want you to be able to specifically take the values on a parent graph and turn those into values that will get you the shifted graph. This is a big thing in college algebra where we provide the parent graph and then we read the commands when we're doing transformations to create a new graph but use the values off the parent graph to help us easily get the new values. I'll be demonstrating that quite a bit, okay? Let's start with the parent graph here. Notice that there's nothing being added or subtracted to this exponent, and then there are no constants being added or subtracted. There's no negatives out here, so no transformations occurring at all. So this is a raw, basic, exponential graph. Exponential graphs always go through um, 0, 1, and if that base, when that base is greater than 1, you're going to have what's called an increasing graph. It will climb upward and to the right. Remember, when you are examining a graph, you're always examining it from left to right, and you're following the curve. And if you were following this curve, the y values would be getting bigger and bigger. So anytime the y values are going up as you follow the curve, we say that it is an increasing graph. And that is always how the graph looks whenever the base is greater than 1. And it'll go through 0, 1. This is a very key point, which if you observe this point, in comparison to where this point is on other graphs, you'll be able to tell whether it has shifted up or down or to the left or to the right or whether it's flipped across an axis. So very key point to keep your eye on when you're trying to think about what kind of transformation um, a new graph may have gone through. Uh, I also want to talk about domain and range as well as the asymptote. Okay, notice that one tail of this exponential function comes very, very, very close. I mean, so close that it looks like it's almost blending with the x-axis when in actuality it never does. 
So when it comes closer and closer to a particular line, that line is known as the asymptote. It is said that the y values approach uh, this x-axis. They get closer and closer. So this is this horizontal line known as the x-axis is uh, considered the horizontal asymptote. Now when we give a horizontal asymptote, we present it as an equation. So this x-axis as an equation is written like this. It's called y is equal to, because it's a horizontal line, all horizontal lines are called y is equal to, and then look at the number that this horizontal line runs through on the y-axis. It runs right through zero. In fact, every single point on the x-axis that you could possibly name has a y-coordinate of zero. And so this equation is a name for the horizontal line called the horizontal asymptote. Okay, we're going to talk about that. We're going to give that in every problem where we graph. The domain for all exponential functions is negative infinity. One tail will go to negative infinity. And then there will be one leg that looks like it either shoots up or shoots down. And I know it may look like it goes straight up, but actually this leg spans outward ever so slightly. And if there was enough paper and they graph, continued graphing more and more values, this would begin to flare out all the way to the right, such that it is said to go to positive infinity. So the domain for all exponential functions is negative infinity for your x values on one side, and then it'll span out to positive infinity in the other direction. And that'll be regardless of whether the graph shifts up or down or left or right, um, or whether it reflects over the x-axis or the y-axis. The domain will still be negative infinity to positive infinity. However, the range is what changes from graph to graph depending on the transformations that are being suggested in that equation. So you have to look at where the asymptote is. If the asymptote is at zero and the entire graph is above zero, that means if this asymptote is represented as y equal to zero, then all the y values on this graph are greater than zero because the entire graph is above the zero mark. So when you write this um, in set builder notation, you could say the y values are all greater than zero. Remember, this tail never actually blends into the x-axis. It's Even though it's very you know, difficult to see with the naked eye, all of the graph, even this tail that gets very close to the x-axis is above the x-axis. So all y values are actually greater than zero, not equal to zero. The way that you're going to be expected to state that the all the y values are greater than zero is in interval notation. So you'll be expected to talk about the range like this. When we talk about the range in interval notation, we don't mention the variable, but it is in taken um, that it is, we're talking about the y value. So it's everything from zero, not including zero, to infinity. And that's what you see right here where I labeled the range for you. Okay, so domain is everything from negative infinity to infinity in interval notation, and the range is everything from zero to infinity, not including zero. Okay, we have a table of values here where I just wanted to remind you of some of the algebraic mechanics that go into this. You may use your calculator um, to get these values just so that you can, you know, get the, the graph in a reason. I don't want you to only be able to produce a graph by just putting the function in and pressing graph. No, you need to be able to show that you, know, you need to, that you know how to get some of the table values. Although you can assist yourself with the uh, arithmetic. Like for instance, if you want to just press two to the negative third into your cal to, into the two to the negative third into your calculator and get a decimal here, that's fine. Um, I'll try to mention both values um, as I do these tables myself. But this one I made uh, for you. So negative 3, this is the function we're plugging into. So 2 raised up to a power of negative 3. I've already demonstrated on the previous page how to plug in values. 
and you would get one eighth. There is a decimal representation for that if you want to go that way. Uh, two to the negative two is, um, well, if you want to rewrite this where you don't have a negative exponent, I reviewed that on the previous page also. Just drag all of this to the denominator and it would be one over eight. Drag all of this to the denominator, it's one over two squared or one over four and that's equal to 0.25 if you want the decimal version of that. Um, negative one would be one over two to the one or one half and then I did some values where I'm plugging in zero, one, two, and three. So this would be two to the zero is one, two to the one is two, two to the two is four, and you can see it's much easier to evaluate at zero or any positive number. Uh, you might have a you know good shot of doing that without your calculator, but use your calculator for those as well if you'd like. And all of these points are on this graph. Make sure that you know how to demonstrate that they actually are on the graph by just you know drawing a point. If I ask you draw a point at negative one one half you should be able to locate that point. So negative one, one half, that's that point right there. Negative three, one eighth is just negative three. One eighth would just be a hair above that, above that x axis. Negative two, one fourth. And see what happens is this tail is very, very close to the x axis, but then the points start to climb with respect to their y values. And that's what makes it climb so rapidly like this to the point where it almost looks like it's shooting straight up, but it's not. Like I said, this flares out, this leg. It's wider and wider. When you get to negative one, the y value gets higher. Now it is one half. Then you get to zero and the y coordinate is one and they are climbing. Then you get to one, the y coordinate is two and they just get higher and higher, giving it that exponential shape. Okay, so now what we're going to do is get into transformations because much of this class has to do with that. You taking a table of values that go with the parent graph and work off these values to get the new values without plugging each one into the calculator. So what you're doing when you do that is you're just um, using basic arithmetic operations to work off of these values to get your brand new table. And I'm talking either addition or subtraction or just multiplication or division. So it becomes much easier to get the values that way than to keep pressing the um, function into your calculator over and over again because you have all these new numbers. Okay, so we're going to be eyeballing the values that I've already given you on this table. These are the values for the parent graph, and we're going to get each of these graphs. First graph that I'm going to demonstrate for you that is a transformation on the parent graph is this one where we're going to um, flip it over the y-axis. So this is going to be a picture where the graph reflects about the y-axis. That's the same thing as saying it flips over the y-axis. So imagine what it's going to look like, just so you can kind of get a sense before we actually plot all the points. We're going to take this graph and flip it across the y-axis. So it should be uh, going up this way, and the, the tail should be fluttering um, over here on the positive x-axis instead of... All of this will just be reversed, okay? Instead of going up on the right, it'll go up on the left. Instead of having the tail... Um, close to the negative x-axis, it'll be close to the negative, to the positive x-axis. But that's going to become apparent in the points that we are now going to get. Okay, now I want to show you how to get the points right off of the parent table. Why don't we just stick with a shortened version of this table. Instead of going from negative 3 to 3, we'll just go um, negative 2 to 2. Okay, so let's read the commands before we start popping stuff into our new table so we can figure out what is this telling us to change notice that this new function says take your x values and multiply them by negative one you see that there's a negative one multiplier in front of this x well what you have to remember is just like with a horizontal shift like if this was to say x plus three you'd really go x minus three 
you would move your graph in the opposite direction. And that happens to be true every single time you do an operation on your x variable. You will always reverse the operation. So, and I'm going to, I know we're only, multi, this only says multiplication by negative 1. And even if we reversed the operation and took all of our x values from the parent graph, and even if we reversed that and divided by negative 1, uh, we would still get the same values as if we didn't reverse it. But I want to do, I want to, you know, help you to memorize something, um, a technique that's going to work even when it's not a negative 1. Because if this would have been a negative 2 in front of that x or a negative 3, and if you didn't reverse the operation, you would get all the values in the new graph wrong. So let's always try to memorize techniques that are going to work in all cases, not just the simplest case. So although this says multiplication by negative 1 on the x, because it is the x variable, you're always going to reverse the operation. So opposite of multiplying by negative 1, divide by negative 1. Reverse the operation whenever you are working on your x's. That is not true when you're working on your y's. So we're going to take um, the x's and we're going to divide by negative 1. What are we going to divide by negative 1? The values, the x values. This is for the x's I'm talking about. So we're going to divide the x values that are on the parent table, divide each of them by negative 1. Super easy to do in your head. So we're going to take and these values right here, just a shortened version. We'll go all the way from this x value to this x value. So when you divide by negative 1, all it does is switch the sign. So this negative 2 will become positive 2. This negative 1 will become positive 1. Uh, 0 is signless, so it doesn't matter what you divide it by. It's still 0. Uh, 1 divided by negative 1 is negative 1. And 2 divided by neg uh, negative 1 is negative 2. Okay, so I've taken each of the x's and divided by negative 1. Yet nothing is said in this brand new graph about your y values because things that are being done to y, they will be numbers either added or subtracted. That affects your y values. Those are called vertical shifts or it'll be numbers that are out here in the front. Only when you see operations that are being mingled with the x variable is that something that you're being indicated to perform on the x variable. Anything else is something that you're doing on the y. So you have to look at where these extra brand new operations are. So I am really being told to do nothing to the y's. So you're going to, the y's, you're going to report them as is, just as they were given in the parent graph with no changes. Okay, so <clears throat> from the numbers that we grabbed from this parent table, y partners were 1 fourth, 1 half, 1, 2, and 4. And they remain the same. 1 fourth, 1 half, there was a 1, a 2, and a 4. Okay, so what I discussed with you a couple of minutes ago, that this is going to flip right over the y-axis. Note that when you plot these brand new points that we've created in the table, that's exactly what you get, and I've already done the graph for you here. Let's just confirm that these, uh, not these points that we got by understanding how to react to the changes in this function um, as compared to the parent graph, that it actually does give you this graph. So this is the graph right now that we just created. h of x is equal to 2 to the negative x. Note that all these points are on this graph. Okay, so this was the original one right here. That's the original one. This is the new one that I'm working on. I probably should have done this in the same color. 
and notice that it's going to flip. It flips right over that y-axis and note that these points are actually on it. When you go to two and you go up one fourth, that's that point right there. When you go to one and you go up one half, that's that point. See these y values climbing, only it's going in the opposite direction. When you plot this point, zero, one, notice that it is definitely on this pink graph, this pink line. When you go to negative one, you're up at two. So this point is actually on it. And when you go to negative two, you're all the way up here at four. So everything that we got on this table by reacting to what this is telling you to do to the points on your parent graph, they actually are on that graph. So this is a way to get transformed graphs, learning how to read the commands and what those commands are telling us to do to the points that are on the parent graph. Okay, there's one other graph here. So what I just demonstrated was a reflection over the y-axis. We use the word about, same thing, it means it flipped over the y-axis. Now we're going to flip over the x-axis. And when they're indicating that you're going to flip over the y-axis, the negative will be out here. Now notice that that negative is not mingled with the x in any way. It is not part of the x expression. Therefore, they're telling you to perform that operation on your y values. Okay, so it is this the basic function multiplied by negative 1, and that's exactly what you're going to do to your y values. You, are gonna, you don't reverse the operation whenever you're working on your y values. You do exactly what's indicated and you know that this is not something that you're doing to x, otherwise it would be right in there with the x expression. So we're going to do this to the y's. We will not reverse the operation. We're just going to take our y's, and we're going to multiply those y's by negative 1. What y values are we going to multiply by negative 1? The ones from the parent table, the parent graph. Okay, this command is actually telling us to leave the x's as is. It's not telling us to do anything. You just have a bare basic x here. So we are going to leave the x's as is. Okay, let's go grab those same values that we've been working with. Negative 2 to 2, just so our graph is not so big. We're leaving the x's as is. So negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Okay, everything from negative 2 to 2. However, the partners that were with those values in the parent graph, we're going to multiply each of them by negative 1. So let's go grab those as well. Those values were 1 fourth, 1 half, 1, 2, 4. 1 fourth, we're multiplying it by negative 1, 1 half multiplying that by negative 1, then there was a 1, a 2, and a 4, each one being multiplied by negative 1, which just switches its sign. Okay, and there they are right there. I just copied these four values from the parent table, and I multiplied each of these y partners um, by negative 1. That went with negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Okay, notice that I'm not putting any of this in the calculator. You're just showing this by hand. Also, notice that as discussed, I was discussing with you before we filled in these values, that when you have a negative out in front like this, that it causes it to flip over the x-axis, whereas when the negative is mingled up here in the exponent with the x expression, it causes it to flip across the y-axis. Note that all of these points are on this graph down here. It's this graph below the y-axis, I mean below the x-axis. Okay, notice that negative 2, negative 1 fourth is on this graph underneath the x-axis. Go to negative 2, negative 1, negative 2, come down just a smidge, about one negative 1 fourth, and there's that point. Go to negative 1, 1 half, negative 1, Go down a little further, you're now you're at 1 half, that point's on there. Go to 0, negative 1, and these lines are slowly going to negative infinity. Go to 1, you're at negative 2. 
all of these points that we obtained just by knowing how to react to that command of having a negative out front, how we, uh, we just talked about how to act upon our values in the um, parent table in order to get these. Two, negative four is right here. Two, three, four, right there. Anyway, just wanted to show you that all these values that we create, because this is a way, what I'm offering you is a way to get your own graph and to be able to show it by hand, showing that you understand how to react to these transformations. Okay, let's also talk about domain and range for each of these graphs. We've already talked about the parent graph because I just yanked these values from up above. So let's talk about the domain and range for each of these new graphs. One was a reflection across the y-axis. The other one was a reflection across or over the x-axis. So we reflected over the y-axis, that's the pink one, and then we reflected over the x-axis, which was this, what I highlighted in blue. This was called the g of x function. Okay, the domain, let's talk about the domain and range right here. Uh, the asymptote, once again, for all of these is y equal to zero. Unless you have a horizontal shift, we have not gone over that yet, um, excuse me, a vertical shift. If you have a vertical shift, something that takes the graph and picks it up or yanks it down, that horizontal shift is going to remain as the x-axis. When you have a vertical shift, it'll change the range. But since we don't have that, the range is going to be dictated by this. We're going to judge it based on that. Okay, so look at this pink graph. All the y values on this pink graph are above the x-axis. That x-axis, which is uh, the horizontal asymptote, all the y values here are zero. And since this pink graph is above it, um, the range on this graph right here is all y values um, greater than zero. Okay, that, that's the same thing as saying zero to infinity. That's when they ask you to do um, the range. And so you see that right in here. The range is everything from zero to infinity. The domain, as I was trying to point out um, in the first parent graph, it doesn't change for any of these graphs. The, the domain is going to be positive infinity. See this tail on the pink graph? It goes out to positive infinity. And this uh, leg that looks like it shoots up, it actually flares out, out, out. It gets wider and wider, and that is what domain's about. It's the width of the graph. So this actually does get wider going to negative infinity, and that's why, once again, the domain is negative infinity to infinity, and you will note, notice that every time I do a graph, that's going to be the domain. Okay, on this blue graph that's underneath the y equal to zero line. Well, on that graph, all the y values are below the zero line. So all the y values are less than zero. That can be said like this. All these y values, well, this is the y values going to negative infinity down here. And these are the y values getting close to zero, but not actually being on top of zero. So the range for this blue graph is negative infinity to zero, but never actually being equal to zero, which is why there's a parenthesis around the zero. Horizontal asymptote for all three of these graphs that you see here is um, y equal to zero for the horizontal asymptote. Okay, so heavy discussion on domain range, reading the commands so that you can produce a transformed graph. Okay, now let's look at other types of transformations. We just looked at reflections, flipping over the y-axis, flipping over the x-axis. Now let's look at horizontal and vertical shifts. Here you see uh, the parent graph. I'll do the parent graph in yellow again. That's this one right here. Okay, that's just your basic parent graph right there. 
And then you have a graph that has been lifted three units up in the air. Now note where this three is. This three is a free loose constant that is not mingled up here in the air where the exponent is. It is not part of the X expression. So basically this is a command about what to do to your Y values. You're going to take your Y values from the parent graph and you're going to add three. Nothing is being indicated as an operation to do to X. There's nothing being added to this X or subtracted. So we're not going to do anything to the X. We're going to leave the X's as is. Leave those alone but take each and every Y value that goes with the X's that we're concentrating on from the parent graph. Once again, I have copied it for you here and given you the parent graph again. So the values we've been concentrating are on the negative two, the negative one, zero, one, and two. We're gonna just copy those as is. And um, the Y partners, we're going to do what this command says so that we don't have to enter this into the calculator over and over again with each of these values. You can do it very quickly by just noting what were the Y partners. You might find it more convenient since you're going to be adding three to look at them in their decimal form. So I provided that here. Uh, the partner for negative two was one four, same thing as 0.25, but we're adding three. So 3.25. Y partner with negative 1 was 0.5. We're adding 3, so 3.5. Y partner with 0 was 1. We're adding 3, 4. Y partner with 1 is 2, but we're adding 3. So that's 5, and so on. 4 plus 3, 7. So without entering this in the calculator, I have these Y partners, and notice that they are on this graph that is shifted three units up in the air. And the easiest way to see that this shift is, had occurred is to compare that key point, zero, 01, that's on the parent graph. This is the key point that the parent graph will go through when it hasn't gone through any shifts or transformations. Notice that on this shifted graph right up here where we're doing a vertical shift three units up. That's this graph right here. Notice that you can tell if you just even compare that one point. Go up one from this point right here. Up one, up two, up three. And there you go. There is that graph with its key point now up here at zero four. And that's even a point right here on our graph. In fact, all of these points are on this pink graph. We got them by knowing how to respond to these commands with respect to the parent graph values and that we only needed to act on the Y values with, you know, as far as uh, creating any changes. But notice that they are all on the graph. Negative 2, 3.25. Here's negative 2. And then this is, let's see negative 2, and then we're up at 1, 2, 3, and just a hair above the mark where 3 is, is 3.25. So that negative 2, 3.25 is on the graph. Negative 1, 3.5 is on there. Go to negative 1, go up to 3, and then right there is 3.5. 0, 4, we already discussed that 0, 4 is there. 1, 5 is right here. All these points on our table. So that means this is a legitimate way of getting the points on the table. Just look at the a table that's already been created and act on either the X or the Y or both, whatever you're being commanded to do in this new function. 2, 7 is also on there. There's the 2, 7 right there and so forth. Okay, so this is the graph h of x. Okay, I want you to also notice that it is not using the x-axis as the horizontal asymptote anymore. If the entire graph shifts up or down, it will have a new horizontal asymptote. So this is the new horizontal asymptote right here. y is equal to 3. 
this line is uh, three units up in the air, and that's your new horizontal asymptote. Okay, so that is the equation right there. Y equal to three. The domain, as it always is, is negative infinity to infinity, but the range is always determined with respect to the horizontal asymptote. So if the whole graph is resting or is created above the horizontal asymptote, that means every Y value on this graph is greater than three. Okay, and that is the same thing, you know, when you say that all your y values are greater than 3, but you're expected to answer in interval notation, that means that there are 3, the y values, or bigger. When we answer in interval notation, we don't mention the variables that we're talking about. Okay, moving to horizontal shifts. Again, we're going to create this brand new table of values so that we don't have to plug this into the calculator over and over again with all the x values that we're going to use. We don't want to keep plugging that in over and over again. So the quicker way to do this is to understand, like I said, how to respond to the commands. This is a command on x. That's why the 3 is right there, part of the x expression. Remember that whenever you're doing anything on the x's, you will reverse the operation. Must reverse the operation. So although it appears that you're being commanded to add 3 to the x's, you are going to take your x's, and I'll put it right here, I have more room here. You're going to take your x's and you're going to subtract 3. Don't forget to reverse that operation. Where are you getting the x's? Where I've gotten them every time, the parent table. We're concentrating on negative 2 to 2. So let's take those values, but let's subtract 3. Negative 2, take away 3, easy enough to do in your head, is negative 5. Negative 1, take away 3, negative 4. 0, take away 3, negative 3. 1, take away 3 negative 2. 2 take away 3, negative 1. So I just transformed all of my x's based on this command. You are not being asked to do anything to the y values because if you were, that would be a constant out here, added or subtracted, or it would, might be a multiplier that's out here. Those are commands on the y. When they want you to do it to the x, it'll be part of the X expression in the exponent. Okay, so we're going to leave the y's as is. Okay, the y values that went with these x partners that we just worked on were 0 0.25, 0 0.5. You can use them in their fraction form or decimal form, doesn't really matter. 1, 2, 4. Okay, note that all of these values that are in this table are actually on this graph that has moved horizontally three units to the left. And that's this graph right here. Okay, notice that negative 5.25, if you're at negative 5 and you just go up a tiny smidgen, that represents negative 5.25. Negative 4.5 is right there. Negative 3.1 is right here. Negative 2.2 2 is right there, starting to climb. And negative 1.4 is there. And that's right there. So, always showing you that what we created by our knowledge of how to respond to the new commands, um, that those points end up being on your shifted graph. So we looked at a graph that shifted upward three units. This graph, again, you can kind of eyeball that point zero, 0,1 that's on the parent graph and notice that it has now shifted here. It has shifted 1, 2, three units to the left, which is what this says right here, three units to the left. And with it, the entire graph went. It's just easy to compare, you know, a point that you are sure about like this one. But all of the points shifted three units to the left. Okay, as far as the domain, negative infinity, 
two, doesn't go straight up, that arm flares out to positive infinity. So negative infinity to infinity, as far as the range, that graph happens to be respecting this asymptote. Notice that the tail gets closer and closer to this x-axis. Therefore, y equal to zero is the horizontal asymptote for the g of x graph. Okay, whereas the horizontal asymptote for the um, h of x graph was this one. It moved three units up in the air. So the h of x graph right here obeyed this asymptote up at y equal to three. And it was that three that made that happen. So if this uh, blue graph is obeying the uh, x-axis at y equal to zero, that means all the y values on this graph are greater than zero. So they are zero to infinity. Okay, talk about domain, range, reflections over the x-axis, reflections over the y-axis uh, Talk that we discussed on the previous page. And then here we discussed horizontal and vertical shifts. Okay, let's look at one other type of base and the way that it changes the direction of the graph. Everything that we've looked at on the uh, previous four pages had a base that was greater than one. And when the base is greater than one, the graph goes like this. The parent graph climbs to the right. But when the base is in between zero and one, in other words, it's a fraction, but the top of the fraction is less than the bottom. That means that this value is in between zero and one. And in fact, it is. One half is 0.5. That's between zero and one. And that changes the direction. And instead of having an increasing graph that climbs upward to the right, it climbs to the left. And that's known as a decreasing graph. Because when you scan a graph, you're always looking at, at it left to right. You're scanning it from left to right, but following along the curve. And the y values, if you were traveling along this curve, would be going down, down, down. So when the y's are going down, we say that it is a decreasing graph. So that all has to do with the base being between 0 and 1. Okay, so let's use this as our parent graph for any kind of a graph uh, where the base is between 0 and 1. And let's look at, you know, a little bit of transformations here. So I'm giving you um, a table where I've already prepared um, the y partners um, for these x values, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. I showed you the actual arithmetic here. You can put this in your calculator, though. You can go... Um, one half raised to a power of negative two, but of course I do want to go over the mechanics with you so that you're not incapable of doing problems by hand, which you will be required to do. So let's say you were plugging in negative two. It would be one half to the negative two, and I was talking about on the first couple of pages of this outline that if you want that power to change into a positive power, flip the base. Flip this over, let it be 2, and the power is now 2. So now this is 2 squared, which is 4. If you start off with 1 half to a negative power of, ne a power of negative 1, because you're plugging in negative 1 there, flip the base. Flip it over, it becomes 2, now the power is 1. See, rewriting it so that the power is 1 enables you to do it without your calculator. You'll be required to do that. 2 to a power of 1, I mean, for certain problems. I'm not saying that you have to do it like that when you're uh, graphing. So 2 to the 1, that's equal to 2. When you plug in a 0 into this function, anything to the 0 power is 1, so no need to flip the base. Um, here you're plugging in just positive 1 right there, so 1 half to the 1. When the power is 1, then it's whatever the base is equal to. 1 half to the 1 is 1 half. 1 half to a power of 2 would just mean apply that 2 to the top so that it's 1 squared, 1, and also apply it to the denominator, which would make it 2 squared or 4. Okay, and all these points are on this graph. Negative 2, 4 is right here. 
right there. Negative 1, 2 is right here. Uh, 0, 1, right there. See, whether this graph is an increasing graph that climbs upward and to the right, or whether it's a decreasing graph, both of them have that key point on these exponential graphs of 0, 1. Okay, I'm talking about the parent graphs. Whether it's increasing or decreasing, it'll have that key point of 0, 1. Notice that the asymptote right here is y equal to 0. Okay, it will always be the horizontal line that that tail gets closer and closer and closer to. That'll be your horizontal asymptote, and that horizontal asymptote helps us tell what the range is when we're asked that. Okay, so why don't we perform some transformations on this particular graph? Okay, right now I have given you um, a brand new function. This is the parent graph right here. And you have that table of values right above. And now I have a new graph called, uh, a new function called g of x, and it's going to produce a new graph. I am doing this to the x and this to the y. Okay, that number is not part of the x expression. So this is what you're doing to the y's. And remember, when we are doing things to the y's, we do not reverse the operation. And I'm going to write that right here. Then on my y values, I'll simply be subtracting 3. However, when we do things to the x's, we reverse the operation. I want you to get in the habit of that so that when you get into a problem where it's not just multiplication by negative 1, but rather multiplication by negative 2 or 3 or whatever, that you remember to reverse the operation because it will definitely matter in those cases. Okay, we need a generic rule that's going to work for everything. All right, so reverse that operation and we will divide the x's by the coefficient indicated here. This says multiplication by negative 1. We're dividing by negative 1. Okay, and what numbers are we going to do these things to? Division by negative 1 and y is where the 3 is subtracted. The values from the parent graph. That way we don't have to plug this into your calculator over and over again with different x values. Okay, so the x values we're concentrating on, we're dividing all of them by negative 1, and we'll do so as we deliver them to this table. Negative 2, and you know that division, dividing all these by negative 1 will just switch the sign. So this will become positive 2, positive 1, 0 is signless. Uh, the positive 1 that's up here, after we divided it by negative 1, that'll become negative 1 and negative 2. Okay, the y values, we're going to be subtracting 3 from them. So again, glance up here at the parent table. 4 take away 3 is 1. 2 take away 3 is negative 1. And I already have those two values here. 4 take away 3 was 1. Uh, next y value was 2 in the table above, and I subtracted 3 and got a negative 1. Uh, the next y value in the table above was a 1. 1 take away 3, negative 2. Uh, the next value was 1 half. We're subtracting 3. And if you can't do that in your head, yeah, let your calculator help you out. You could go 1 half, take away 3, and then just press Enter. And you get negative 2.5. Okay, last value on that parent table was 1 fourth, but we're subtracting 3 on those y values. So 1 fourth minus 3, negative 2.75. Okay, so we have brand new values that are going to create a brand new graph with two transformations included. Okay, no, I've already graphed it for you, but note that these are on the graph. So we go to 1. And this would be the original graph right here. Okay, that's your parent graph where the base was um, a fraction uh, and the B value, this B value was between 0 and 1, just a fraction that's less than 1. And the domain was negative infinity to positive infinity, as all the domains are. 
y values were greater than zero, or in other words, zero to infinity. Horizontal asymptote, as I discussed above, for the original y equal to zero. Now you have this graph, and this graph was formed from the points that we just created. Two, one, that's that point right there. Hard to see these lines. This is two, one right here. Uh, one negative one. Let's see, one negative one, that's one negative one. Here's another point on that brand new graph. Zero negative two right there. And if you want to talk about that vertical shift where the whole graph went down three units, which is what I discussed right here, where it went down three units, why don't you compare a point that's on the original graph, zero, one, that key point. Notice that it is now one, two, three units lower. So this entire graph, if that point went three units lower, the entire graph went three points, um, three units lower, including the uh, horizontal asymptote. Anyway, the rest of the points here are uh, negative one, negative 2.5. Notice that that's there. Negative one, negative 2.5. Negative one, negative two, negative, that's right there. And then negative two, negative 2.75. Negative 1, negative 2, 1, 2, and 2.75 would be a little bit lower than the negative 2.5. So this is our new graph with both transformations causing it to be where it is right now. Okay, new asymptote is right here, all dictated by your vertical shift. This graph shifted three units down, therefore the new horizontal asymptote is at y equal to negative three, just as it says right there. This is your new horizontal asymptote. So that horizontal asymptote allows us to talk about the range. What are the y values on the graph? They are all y values above negative three. So negative three to infinity. Domain as it always is, negative infinity to infinity. Okay, one more of these graphs where we're comparing the parent values, and then we'll kind of do a review where we'll do um, some graphs where we're matching. Just a review of everything that's been covered on the first, you know, five or six pages. Okay, so in this one, this time we have a base of E, and if you're not familiar with the E value, we'll go over it um, again, it's come up in several of the other chapters, but if you just go second, come down the first column right here, you see that E value, it's just like a pi value, it's an irrational decimal that runs on and on and on. If you could just go E to the 1, that's the same thing as E. And that's what, um, this is what it represents. I raised it to the first power, so you're just really looking at the E value here. It goes on and on and on. Um, and so it's an irrational number. But anyway, I wanted you to see that what I'm about to graph does not have a base between 0 and 1 as it did on the last page, but it has a base that's greater than 1. This number is greater than 1, and therefore you're going to have your typical increasing graph with that key point going right through 0, 1. So this is the graph f of x is equal to e to the x, where the base is bigger than 1, and that's why it climbs upward and to the right. Um, I did these values for you. I plugged in negative 2, negative 1, 0. We, we've had practice on the previous pages of this outline plugging in all these values, and these are the values that I got. So, you know, when you go to graph them, you can just think of it as 0 0.1, 0 0.4. You can round them off more severely than the decimals that you're seeing here. You can think of this as just, you know, a little bit higher than 7. This is almost all the way to 3. You know, you have to approximate when you're trying to graph using decimals. And anything that involves E is going to be, you know, uh, having to do with decimals and rounding off. Okay, but again, one of the main skills that we are practicing in this particular section is that we're trying to learn how to carry out brand new commands to produce brand new graphs 
from the parent table. So we're using this as the parent table. This is referred to the parent graph for the E function because there's nothing being done to X and nothing being done to Y. So these would represent your parent values and we are going to carry out these commands on those parent values. Okay, so look what's being asked here. You're being asked, it appears, to add 3 to the X, but anything having to do with the X's, you are going to reverse the operation when working on your X's. Reverse that operation, you must remember that. Whereas this negative 2, you will not reverse the operation because this is a command on what you're doing to the Y values. So on the Y values, we're actually going to be subtracting 2, whereas for the X values, instead of adding 3, we're going to subtract 3 on those X values. We're going to take our X values and subtract 3. Where are we getting these X and Y values? From the parent table. Let me just move this over a little bit. It's running right off the page. Okay, so I've reversed the operation that was suggested here because it's an operation on X and I am subtracting 2 from the Y values. So let's just do them one at a time. Let's go grab those X values and we'll subtract 3 from each one as we deliver it here. So negative 2, take away 3, negative 5. Uh, negative 1, take away 3, negative 4. 0, take away 3, negative 3. 1, take away 3, negative 2 and 2 take away 3, negative 1. So I already carried this out on all my x's from the parent table. And then as far as the y values, I should be subtracting 2. So if I subtract 2, it would be 0.1353 subtract uh, 2, and I get negative. I'm just going to round these off a little bit more severely, uh, negative 1.9. Okay, and then I'm going to do 0.3679 minus 2. 0.3679 minus 2. That gets me about negative 1.6. And then I'm going to do negative, or no, the next one is 1. The next y value, so 1 minus 2. I guess you don't need your calculator for that. And then I'm going to get uh, do this 2.7 minus 2. I know there's more decimals here, but 2.7 approximately minus 2 would just be 0.7. And then this would be 7.4, about 7.4 minus uh, 2, which is what we're doing to our y values. 7.4 minus 2 would be about 5.4. And so we have a whole new set of values where we've carried out this command and we've carried out this command, thus transforming um, this graph. Okay, the transformations that are occurring, this is a horizontal shift three units to the left because once you reverse the operation, it becomes a negative. So you're going left three units on this new graph. Uh, and then we did um, subtracting 2 on the y's. That makes it go down 2 units and also changes the horizontal asymptote. Okay, so this is going to be your new horizontal asymptote. Y equal to negative 2. 2 units lower than the x-axis, which is also going to help us talk about the range. Okay, notice that all these points on the graph, on the new graph, the new table, are right here. Okay, this was our parent graph for a base of E. And this is the new graph where we've done two transformations to come up with this new graph and this new asymptote. Okay, so as far as the domain and the range go, well, this entire new graph is above this line called y equal to negative 2. 
So every single y value on this graph is above this line or greater than this line. So it's everything, the range values or the y values, because that's what range is about, the y values. Everything from negative 2 to infinity, not including negative 2, because this line never actually touches the y equal to negative 2 line. The domain, same thing it always is, asymptote I already discussed. Okay, come to the last two graphing problems in the section where we are just matching. We're matching each of the transformations. So um, this exercise and the one on the next page just um, acts as a review to make sure that you know how to uh, respond to the different kinds of transformations. We studied reflections, vertical shifting, and horizontal shifting. So uh, this first one you're seeing, you might want to identify the parent graph first to be successful at these matching problems because then each time you go to look at a graph to pick out which of these equations goes with it, um, you can compare it to the parent graph. So basically, let's see if I can make this page smaller so we can see everything at one time. Just this a little bit. Okay. All right, so this would be the parent graph. It has no alterations on it whatsoever. Let's identify which one is that one is. Remember, it goes through 0, 1. Base is greater than 1, and therefore it's an increasing graph that climbs upward and to the right. So that would be uh, this one right here. Okay, this is the parent graph. f of x, so this is choice f, f of x is equal to just 4 to the x. Okay, then let's start comparing these other ones with respect to the parent graph, because that's what gets you, helps you to pick out which of these goes with it. So if we were looking at this one compared to the parent graph, if we were looking at this upper graph, notice that what has happened to this graph to make it look like that one is that this has flipped over um, the y-axis. So we learned on one of the first graphs that we did that when it flips across the y-axis is because the x value is being multiplied by negative 1. So this would be choice B. Okay, and that would be f of x. This function right here is equal to 4. x is multiplied by negative 1. It flips it over the y-axis. This next graph that you're seeing this graph, a couple of different things have happened. Let's see. It has flipped over um, the x-axis, right over the x-axis. So again, keep comparing what you are trying to pick an equation for to the parent graph. Look at this parent graph. If you were to take this parent graph right here, down here, and flip it over the x-axis, this tail would come down. And instead of this tail fluttering above the x-axis, it would flutter below it. And that's exactly what this graph is doing. Okay, flipping something over the x-axis is what is happening in this equation, part A. When you have a negative multiplier, I'll write it like this. Okay, so this was B, this was A. This one was f. And when you flip over the x-axis, the equation looks like this. Okay, and we can write what each of these things are. This is reflection about or over the y-axis when you compare it to the parent graph. This one was reflection about the x-axis, or you could say it across the x-axis. This was the parent graph. Now let's look at these other three pictures. The other three pictures with respect, so we've already used, um, and let's, so we're not concentrating on these anymore, we used that one, we used this one. Um, the other one that we've used, let's see, is, well, f is just the parent graph. Okay, so coming now over here, 
we have a graph that looks like it has gone two units down. How do I know that it's gone two units down? Because I'm always comparing that one point on the parent graph, the zero one point, and if that's gone two units down, it's just going to be at zero negative one. Notice that this graph has the same shape. It climbs upward and to the right. It's not flipped across the y-axis or over the x-axis. It just simply has this point right here has been yanked down two units. It used to be here. It's now down here. And so when you're doing a vertical shift downward of two units, that would be this one right here. This is choice E. The function f of x is 4 to the x minus 2. So vertical shift 2 down. Okay, moving to this one right here. Okay, this next graph, let's compare that once again to the parent graph. So compared to the parent graph, if I'm eyeballing this point right here and noticing that on this graph, instead of having a point that's at 0, 1, it is now over here. So this graph has actually shifted two units to the right. So this one is a horizontal shift two to the right. And that's because I'm comparing the point that's on the parent graph that is typically at 0, 1. And there is no point on this graph at 0, 1. It's over now, two units to the right. So when you're moving two units to the right, it's a horizontal shift. And that would be indicated by this function. Instead of x plus 2, it's in the graph. In the function, it's going to say x minus 2. But in the graph, it actually, the x is you're adding two to them because remember the operation is always reversed when you're getting ready to do the graph as opposed to what it says in the function so this is choice c the function f of x is equal to four to the x minus two okay last function that you see here okay so we've used E, we use C, there's only one, and that has a double uh, reflection. It um, has shifted, it has reflected or flipped across the y-axis as well as the x-axis. So in comparison to this, it flipped across here and then over, and it's the only one that's left, which is D. Okay, this one is D. And that's F of X is equal to that flipped it over the x-axis, this flip, flipped it over the y-axis. So this one reflects over the y-axis, and it'll also reflect over the x-axis. Double reflection. Okay, so matching a review of the last six pages and all the graphs that were discussed. This last problem concerning graphs is the same thing. You're going to pick uh, the matching graphs here. And again, I would suggest only this time you have a base that's between 0 and 1. So instead of that increasing graph that goes like this up and to the right, this has one that is goes uh, up and to the left. This is a decreasing graph, and we also looked at these. So let's do one more matching just as a review. Why don't we find the parent graph first? Just look for the parent equation. It won't have any multiplication by negative 1 or adding or subtracting or anything like that. Just bare basic bones decreasing graph. Okay, that would be this one. That's the equation. And the graph that exemplifies that or demonstrates that is this one right here, D. Notice that it goes through that, still goes through that key point, 0, 1, but instead of climbing this way to the right, it climbs to the left. It's the only difference between having a base like this that's less than, um, that's in between 0 and 1, and having a base that's greater than 1. Okay, so this would be f of x is equal to 1 fourth 
It is the x, it is the parent graph. Okay, everything will be compared to that as we look at the rest of these um, graphs. Okay, so in part, this uh, graph that you see right here, this graph appears to have a horizontal shift. What I'm looking at in this graph compared to this is look at this, it goes right through 0, 1, but this graph does not. Instead of going through 0, 1, it does have a point up at 1, just like this is up at 1, only it is over here now. So this graph has slid or horizontally shifted two units to the left as though it was a negative 2. So in the function, it's going to be the opposite. It'll be x plus 2, and that would be e. Okay, when the function says x plus 2, the shift is at minus 2. It goes negative 2. Okay, so this would be e. This is a horizontal shift to the left units and the function is f of x is equal to um, one-fourth x one-fourth to a power of x plus 2 that's what the function looks like which resulted in this equation right here okay so we did the parent graph use this one coming to this second graph right here this second graph has flipped over um, the x-axis. So let's make sure we're going to compare it to this right here. Okay, what equation would that be? Okay, so it looks like all that happened if you're comparing this parent graph to this is that it flipped over the x-axis. So instead of being going through that key point 0, 1, it is now um, going through 0, negative 1. Instead of this tail going up, it is now going down, which is how you can tell that it flipped. It just flipped right over that x-axis. That would be this equation right here. Okay, so this one's f. I'm not going to write the equation because it's written right there. And I'll just point out that this is a reflection about, and it's all because of that, about the x-axis. When it flips over the y-axis, remember, the negative will be with the, with the uh, x expression. Okay, so we've picked out three of them. Okay, we also picked out uh, f, so we're done with this one now. And now we're going to go over to the other three, comparing it to the parent graph as well. So in this next one, up here in the upper right-hand corner, if you compare it to this um, parent graph right here, Let's see what's happened with that one. That one looks like it is the double reflection, but let's look at the easier two first, and then we will be even more sure of that. This is the double reflection, where you have the x being multiplied by negative 1 as well as the y being multiplied by negative 1, which is probably going to be this one. Look at these other ones. They're a little bit easier to look at. This graph has the same shape as the parent graph, goes up on the left, and then um, it starts to have approach its horizontal asymptote on the right. It's just that that point, that y-intercept of 0, 1, is now higher. Instead of being at 0, 1, it is 1, 2 units higher. So this is a vertical shift, 2 units up, 2 units up. So that should be, let's see, that would be this one right here. That would be B. Okay, so this is uh, B for this one. Let me write that first, and then I'll actually write the function. I just described it for you. So this is choice B. And then the function for choice B, you can see there's that uh, vertical shift right there, is 1 fourth to the x plus 2. Okay, so that one's done. And then this one right here, if you compare it 
Um, to the parent graph, let's see what's going on with uh, this one. Okay, so this one, what happened is, if you compare this shape and this shape, notice this goes up on the left, this one goes up on the right. So what happened is this graph got flipped over the y-axis. This flip-flopped over that y-axis, also known as a reflection, which made it look like that. That would be choice A. Okay, so this is choice A. So reflecting over the y-axis. And the function would be f of x is equal to 1 fourth as the base raised up to negative x. That makes this picture flip across the y-axis. So instead of going up here, now it flipped up and it goes across here. And then instead of the tail going to the right, it goes to the left, which is what's happening in that graph. Okay, so we used A. So this one with the double reflection does belong to this graph right here. So this would be choice C. And the actual function is negative. Flipped across over the x-axis, which is what that's about, as well as reflecting over the y-axis. So this was a double reflection. Reflect over the x-axis, that's that, and it also reflects over the y-axis, which is this negative right here. Okay, and that is all of the graphs. So that completes numbers 1 through 12, all of the graphing theory, exponential graphs, and also some calculational type problems, evaluating evaluating exponential functions, sometimes using your calculator, and then other times giving an exact answer. And I am going to do the rest of the problems in section 5.1 in the second video for this section. Okay, that completes numbers 1 through 12 in section 5.1.